Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, Hour 3, our Earth Changes, Civil Defense and Preparedness Special Panel. And, of course, we have John Moore, who has his own radio show on Republic Radio from 7 to 9 a.m. Central Standard Time, Monday to Friday. His website, thelibertyman.com. Ann Morrison, our scientist, expert in volcanology, earthquakes, ultraviolet light, etc., as a consultant. And she has her website, Homeland-Defense, for you. Probably back in about a week's time, I think we'll have Robert Felix. The bottom of the hour will be joined by Chris Harris, our nuclear expert. That's his radio name, not his real name. He is one of 40-plus top nuclear safety experts that works for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and private business, private corporations, doing analysis of safety and giving them recommendations that will save the, the companies from major problems with their reactors. And, of course, Chris will come back to, to highlight further information about what's going on in terms of the Fukushima disaster with the NRC, including the removal now of their director and replacement by Allison McFarland is a smart thing, or they're trying to push things forward. Of course, we know Obama wants to push nuclear reactors, which are patently the design they're using right now. Their methods are incorrect, including the fact they don't have a proper storage facility such as Yucca Mountain, which they should do, or some other facility like a 10 mines, 7 miles down. They should have rail cars to transport it. They don't have safety on site, which could allow, quote, nuclear terrorism where you drive in a conventional bomb or even an air bomb into a nuclear facility with tons of radioisotopes stored on site, so you don't even need to, you don't even need to take it off or steal it. And so we don't really have any safety policies there in terms of our terrorism policy. Um, and uh, now we have some updates from John Moore. John, tell us what's the latest in terms of well, oh, we have Anne. I guess we we. And what's the latest in terms of what's going on with uh, earthquakes, volcanoes, ultraviolet light, and all the earth changes that are occurring? Well, we have a new earthquake. I mean, we have a new volcano. <laughs> oh, I must have been busy today. We have a new volcano. It's in uh, Costa Rica, and it is uh, starting to spew ash. And we even have a uh, uh, from the volcanic ash advisory. Uh, center, we have a picture of that, and it was wrongly attributed to Popo Cattle Petal, but uh, it's a long ways from there, and the ash is heading towards the uh, Gulf of Mexico. So uh, this is one that is not, um, well, it's just not been active, very active. The first I heard about it was last March, and uh, so we've got a. We've got to, uh, you know, we we just have to remind people that the seismic area in Mexico and in Central America and in um, South America and even in the United States is becoming more and more active, and we're going to have more of these ash advisories. And you don't want to, you know, you want to keep aware of them. They may close an airport. In fact, there was a airport closing near Mexico City. The international airport was closed again. I think it was Wednesday. And uh, so you just, you know, might interrupt your travel plans. But in any case, you don't want to breathe the air because you might get volcanic ashes into your, um, into your lungs and that creates a cement. Yeah, and also when you're, you're flying too, you need to also, I tell people, get our our radiation kit, which includes NIOSH N95 masks, they think, oh, well, they're not going to happen in the aircraft. We had one gentleman just a few weeks ago send us a photo of over a 1,000 counts per minute flying over Washington State, which, you know, radiation plume must have come over from Fukushima, 30,000 yeah. feet plus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very important. The N95, what that means is that they're – that they will, uh, N95 respirators are designed to filter particles um, between, well, down to 0.1 micron diameter in size with a filter efficiency of at least 95%. Now, normally the ash is is not that small. In other words, it's, it's not down, it's like one micron. It's not a tenth of a micron. So you, so you will get the ash. You will not get the ash. However, you still might get the VOG. The VOG, V-O-G, is called the volcanic organic gases. And if you uh, breathe those, the H2S, the hydrogen sulfide, um, if you have it in any concentration at all, you'll die. The carbon dioxide, it can suffocate you. The um, sulfur dioxide, the SO2, it can suffocate you besides burning you. So you want to... uh, 
you just, we, we are moving into a geological active time, and we have been since, oh golly, probably probably uh, a thousand years ago, and things are, you know, they remember Krakatoa, and now we have Son of Krakatoa, and a lot of the Indonesian um, volcanoes, and the volcanoes in, in South America were once considered extinct. And and now they're they're uh, becoming even in, active. Even in Iran, there's uh, extinct ones. Let's tie this all together with what's going on in terms of the world geopolitics. We have North Korea getting more aggressive about doing a nuclear test. We've got all these nuclear sites all over America where basically uh, they they're not securing the nuclear material. I told and some years ago back, uh, right after 9/11, uh, Senator Daschle was at, at that time the head Democrat senator. Uh, and told him, I said, look, you know, we need to make certain that we secure this area around the um, around Rocky Flats because they had liquid radioactive waste sitting out on pallets and on, on concrete, you know, areas, flat areas. They were literally out in the open, unprotected, containing liquid plutonium and, and uh, other radioisotopes. Uh, the fact is that we need we we don't really have proper safety procedures increasing, and the removal of Jasco, I think uh, I think that's my pronunciation of his name, who is trying to get increased safety procedures. I think very is very concerning. Uh, what's happening in Japan? Of course, the public are rising up so much they're not going to have any nuclear power now. Uh, I don't believe any nuclear stations have ever quote run a profit. Uh, we could if we do them properly, but they never did it properly. Uh, secondly, you can't have stored on site years and years of radioisotopes without great danger. And uh, you certainly have to stop the use of depleted uranium munitions that are salting the earth and your countries you're supposedly relieving uh, from the enemies are actually salting Iraq and these other countries with depleted uranium. So we have all those things, and on top of that, the earth changes are occurring. And here's the ones that are most concerning. We're seeing an increase since last March 11th of last year a 500% increase in Japan of earthquakes of 5 plus, which means a level 6 earthquake is going to hit sometime in the next six months, which means cooling pool number 4 is going to fall. And the worst part about that is is not just the zirconium fire, which is really bad, but the fact that uh, the area will become so radioactive they can't do anything around any of the buildings again. Anybody here, even suicidal, going into that area is going to die. Uh, they should have put tents over them. They should have put a seawall. They should have put a corium catcher underneath it. They've done nothing except literally on the weekends they go home. We have radiation, 80% of it probably dawdling under the oceans or blowing across the ocean to us, going into the Black or Humboldt Current, which can affect not only the fishery in Alaska, which is the number one fishery, but going all the way to South America where now we're seeing whales and dolphins actually dying and beaching up in Peru. I mean, this is how these animals are dying. We see stewards and stewardesses showing not dry cleaning problems, but sores on their body caused by radioisotopes absorbed at high altitude. And I'm certain the problem, biggest problem we have is a lack of data. Like the data we, that was posted up by Alexander Higgins the other day, that everybody was thinking, oh my gosh, what's going on? We must be having a big radiation release uh, on the 16th of May, when in fact he was reporting a radiation burp of radioiodine-131 that occurred six weeks earlier, we think approximately, based on the data. So. Japan is covering it up. Our government's covering it up. The United Nations has been asked by former Ambassador Murata to do something, and nothing's going on. We have the craziness of the Israeli government thinking that it's a good idea to attack the Bashir reactor, which is a live reactor fully fueled now, that if they hit it, it'll be considerably worse than Chernobyl, added to the radiation dangers of what's going on in Fukushima. So this is, uh, this is going to start degrading not only our life form, humans, but all of the life forms on Earth. And we're already killing the oceans. We have tens of thousands of dead zones. And we are chewing up the ozone layer with Fukushima radioiodine and xenon 133 which means we're getting ridiculously high ultraviolet light caused by that and the decreasing magnetic field of Earth as we move through the galactic plane. So if people think this is a conspiracy theory, they're uninformed. Back in a moment with more with Ann Morrison. Welcome back, and new information about earthquakes and volcanoes. Give us some of that information, uh, and because as these things increase, by the way, 
The consequences are going to be difficulty to grow crops because we're moving into an ice age, decrease in ozone layer, which means we're going to get radiation shock. We tell people over the weekend, I just went and checked our UV index here over Vista, which is relatively mild compared to, say, the high desert Arizona and other places, Texas. Our mm-hmm. UV index on Sunday and Monday is going to reach up to around 11. That's dangerous. So I tell people between 11 and 3, don't be outside. And if you are, be broad-brimmed hats and proper clothing covering your body because we're not dealing with normal sun. We had even as a kid that would give you just a sun blister or a second-degree sunburn. We're talking about sun that can cause cancer or immune depression and uh, ultraviolet light that can cause DNA damage. And we're not just talking about your skin. It can cause problems deeper in your organs because these, this type of high-energy light penetrates much deeper than the skin into the body. It can well, also cause deal. retinal damage, too. And people think, oh, no, it's only during a solar eclipse. No, the, we have a different sun now. It's a toxic sun. And during the middle of the day, even in a cloudy day, 90% of that ultraviolet light, the, the, the A light is the, you know, the tanning light, the B is the burn light, the C is cancer, and D. And the higher the energy you get, the more the clouds don't mean a thing. So even though you're cold and you're outside, and, oh, it's only in the 60s, you can get not only a sunburn, but you can actually get C and D light. And you're not even aware that it's suppressing your immune system or it's causing DNA damage or even penetrating deep into the organs of your body, not just your skin. You can penetrate quite deep. Well, you know, if you're going to have a U, we're going to have a UV index of 11 here on Sunday, and uh, 11 is is where the uh, EPA says you don't want to go outside, and if you do have to go outside, don't stay outside. Now, the, okay, the glass, the glass in your windows in your car will protect you, and uh, the glass in your windows in your house will protect you because UV will not go through glass. And I recommend buying um, glass sunglasses. And they have some out that have a 455 uh, designation, and that is for the, the deep UV. So what you want to do is you want to get the 455 uh, glass sunglasses and yep. that should protect your eyes. Otherwise, you're going to end up blind. Uh, I see all sorts of pictures of people expecting to be at the seashore, at the lake, or, or around swimming pools this, um, this weekend. And uh, those people don't realize that by the time they're, if they're young, by the time they're 30, they're going to have skin cancer and they're going to be blind. And there's, you know, <laughs> that's not what you want when you're 30. <laughs> I mean, it's bad enough when you're 70. Um, the the reason that the deep UV is coming through is because there's a thinning in the stratosphere. The stratosphere normally would take the deep UV and convert oxygen molecules into ozone. Um, so why isn't that happening? Well, they just did a study and they took a picture and they sent up a satellite. They took a picture. They analyzed the, the data and what they've discovered is that there's a huge ozone hole over the Arctic Circle. And it's not just over the Arctic Circle. It comes down over Greenland. And it was sitting look, elsewhere. There's a hold up there, but it's sitting elsewhere. And it's due to xenon-133 and radioiodine, which are speeding up the chemical reaction to degrade the ozone, plus the decreasing magnetic field. You need three things to make an ozone layer to protect us from cosmic background radiation, which is why travel in space is so dangerous. Cosmic background radiation literally is like living in a microwave. And if you don't have an ozone layer... That radiation gets through, so magnetic field of the Earth is decreasing. Oxygen levels are dropping on the planet because, as I mentioned, will peak oxygen. And then the uh, the third thing is this massive chemical reaction chewing it up because of radioiodine from Fukushima and xenon-133. Yeah, we do see a thinning of the stratosphere over desert areas and over the ocean. Um, so, you know, the farmers, I think, are going to have to change their farming practices. They're not going to be able to allow their, their fields not to contain oxygen-producing plants. If, if they want to get enough oxygen into the air to get up to the stratosphere to be turned into ozone so that it will capture the UV, the deep UV rays from the sun, we're going to have to stop um, having barren land. Right now we're having a drought. And it's in uh, especially New Mexico and in western Texas and Arizona, up into the Four Corners. That's why we need. That's why we need projects like NAMAPA, the North American Water and Power. Uh, we have to realize that having deserts dangerous. The ultraviolet light, for example, over the desert areas of, of uh, Africa, over Saudi Arabia, and over the areas of the Sahara. By the way, Sahara is so big you could drop the continental U.S. into it, and you wouldn't even find it in one portion of the desert. That's how big the Saharan Desert is. 
Well, yeah, and we're turning our Midwest into a desert. And well, the, the Dust Bowl back uh, the, the, of the 1930s could happen again easily because of our stupidity. Oh, yeah. Okay, I did want to mention a very important volcano. In, uh, it's, um, it's just off the coast of Greece, and it's called San- Santorina. It's on Santorina Island, so it's halfway between Greece and uh, Crete and Turkey. So if you if you know where those um, countries are, then it's right in the middle of the Sea of uh, Crete. And when it erupted in 1638 B.C., it created a tsunami with a wave height of, can you guess, 150 feet. And this tsunami, tsunami was responsible for the destruction of the population on Crete. Well, a 150-foot tsunami is a significant tsunami. So um, uh, I want people to be aware that we have a satellite that is uh, being, well, it it is declining. It's wearing out, and so we're not getting as much information from it as we used to. But it's it's called Invistat, and... um, What they're doing is they're mining the information that that satellite sent back, and what they've discovered is that there's a there's a um, a chamber of magma that's growing, so the whole land has been uplifted at the island of Santorini near near Greece. You need to know that because if you're on Crete and that Santorini volcano goes, uh, you might find yourself under a lot of water. Now, there wasn't also, there was a significant earthquake, although it didn't get any press. Um, The North Atlantic Ridge runs between the North American tectonic plate and the Eurasian tectonic plate, and that's the tectonic boundary between those two plates. So on the East Coast, unlike the West Coast, our tectonic plate boundary is way out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and it runs from the Canary Islands up through Iceland, and then further north is the Norwegian Sea. And uh, we had a 6.1 earthquake on the Atlantic Ridge up in the Norwegian Sea at a latitude of 72 degrees north. Well, the furthest north you can go is 90 degrees north, so you can tell that this was very close to the Arctic Circle. And the, um, the closer that the earthquakes are, to the north or south pole, the more impact they have on the axis of rotation. They can actually move the axis of rotation. So that was a very significant earthquake, and I would have moved it just in my mind up to a 7.1, just on the basis of where it was located. I hear music. That's very interesting, very important. All these earthquakes and volcanoes, what they mean is we're going to be facing further dangers of tsunamis, any coastal areas like San Onofre, Diablo Canyon, anywhere near a major earthquake fault line zone in any country. That's why Switzerland shut them all down. We'll be back in a moment joined by our nuclear expert, Chris Harris, and get ready to have a great and safe. Welcome back, and we are joined by Chris Harris. And, of course, this ties it perfectly together because the earthquakes increase the risk of a tsunami, the risk of a major breakdown. And the latest news on ENE News now that you've talked about, Chris, let's uh, give us the details of what happened and why we're starting to see the buckling and literally the falling down, the collapse of cooling pool number four, which will make the site completely untreatable. Uh, nobody will, even if they're suicidal, be able to get into the area. And this means a whole new level of disaster. Uh, tell us what's going on. Well, e News is now reporting. Actually, it's a link from uh, Wall Street Journal. I like to go. I, I like to go straight. Uh, I like to go to more, you know, more mainstream sources just to confirm what we we're talking about. There, uh, TEPCO is now reporting that there is a slight buckling of the Unit Four Fukushima Unit Four in an outside wall. And then they go on to claim that it's far from the pool, or the spent fuel pool in this case, and that there's no danger. Uh, they, they do provide 
a uh, I don't believe that by the way I'm, I'm saying that if there's any buckling of any wall at all it will weaken the whole structure because it is basically a giant box and uh, you, if, you, if you do something to one wall where well, you've just weakened the structure uh, everywhere in the in the in the building um, the uh, they do show some this is just like just seen today uh, they are showing some pretty good detailed report on the uh, actual deformation backed up by photographs of thing of uh, co- um, cable trays and cable conduit that you that you run alongside a wall that's pulled out of the wall because of the deformation is so great these are supposed to run in straight lines along the wall right so and, they're all in other words deformation means the actual buckling and bending of the walls so this is ready to blow is what they say it's it's ready to collapse pulling the pipe supports and everything else out of the wall because that 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 wall will eventually collapse and once it collapses anything that's structurally reliant upon its integrity will also collapse so i don't i don't buy that that it's far away from the spent fuel pool and therefore there's no uh it has no effect on it i think that's uh, nonsense so uh you know tepco is trying to spin it uh, unit four looks like it's in a state of collapse, and I don't know how fast it will take, and, and I certainly don't know uh, if, if I, it doesn't appear to be uh, stabilized. Let's put it that way. And it looks like that if uh, there are more jolts due to well, Van was bringing up the likelihood of larger and more frequent earthquakes in that area. Uh, I can't tell you how much it would take for it to topple over or not, but, I, but it certainly looks like it's on its way. Well, one of the comments, too, was one of the mayors said, our bodies are definitely suffering radiation exposure. Can you comment on that? Because this is something that's very significant. This is a, a two, just 2% of Fukushima residents had any radiation testing done by the government. That's obscene. Uh, what's going on there? Are they crazy over there? Are they so manipulated and so passive that they'll put up with this? And Americans are not much better. I mean, most people think that we're kind of nuts, even though you're a nuclear expert, and I was a member of ACOM, the American College for Occupational Environmental Medicine Nuclear Division, and have a background in radiation toxicology. When we say these things, we have our scientists on, like Ann Morrison, who's a consultant for radioisotopes and radiotoxicology, why does the public think that we don't know what we're talking about when they have talking heads that are idiots on CNN and Fox and other networks when we're the real thing? We're citizen journalists telling them that the government's not doing testing of our air, food, and water that's coming from Fukushima, and that we're having airline pilots and stewards being affected by radiation. Uh, I just don't get it. Uh, and this is the biggest environmental disaster. This even tops the Macondo disaster that's still, by the way, is still percolating down the uh, Gulf of Mexico. That's not any better, is it? No, that's, um, I guess you, uh, no, it's, it's not any any better because well, let me let me just uh, I can't really give you the uh, projected health effects on this. I think you, you're actually more of an expert in that than I am, but I'm an expert in the area of the physical plant itself and uh, and uh, what's going on structurally and uh, operationally. We did talk yesterday. Let me go digress a little bit about the. Achilles heel of that spent fuel pool, and I confirmed it after we got off the air yesterday that the gates in the, the spent fuel pool gate in a uh, in a structure known as the cattle chute that goes between the spent fuel pool and the cavity, that's a flooded cavity above the reactor vessel head, uh, is is removed, and that means that if anything happens to uh, cause a leak in the reactor vessel flange, that that um, we looked at a bulkhead and bellows, that's what it was called. If anything happens to that, and that's not a very strong structure, then you will drain a lot of the spent fuel pool. In fact, you'll drain most of it, and you'll do it really quickly. So it looks like to me that that, that could happen, you know, that because if you start getting a buckling in a wall and then you start leaking the area, all it would take is one jolt to pull that uh, – that bellows out of the, um, just break a weld on it. That's all it would take. Remember, the thing is just a, uh, a thin uh, stainless steel ring that goes around the reactor vessel flange and is connected up to all the sides of the actual containment vessel that surrounds it, and uh, which has already been taxed because it's not supposed to be 
uh, holding up all that water for such a length of time as it is now. Now it, and and so it's, it's something that goes corrosion. You can't look at. You can't. Mm. Nobody can get it. You're supposed to periodically look yeah, at that seal. Exactly. So you know if it's if it's leaking. Nobody's going in there to doing anything. Well, leaking. let me read an, an article to back up exactly what you're saying. This is from uh, Robert X. Uh, Kringley, C-R-I-N-G-E-L-Y. It's in beta news, and it says, Fukushima Daiichi requires a Manhattan Project approach to avoid another nuclear accident. And he says uh, there in paragraph 2, that accident involving nuclear fuel rods is virtually inevitable, most likely preventable, and the fact that it won't be prevented comes down solely to the Japanese government, Tokyo Electric Company, TEPCO, incompetence and stupidity. Japanese uh, citizens will probably die unnecessarily because the way things are done at the top of Japan is completely screwed up. And, of course, it's not just there. It's General Electric. When they, they had the so-called czar uh, sent over by Obama to announce last year that he was going to, quote, clear it up and get the plant back up and operational. I mean, it's a, it's a nuclear waste site. And the fact is even the sarcophagus around Chernobyl is not stable, and that where is where the, the critical mass was actually blown apart, so it wasn't being hypercritical. We have evidence of neutron beams coming off there, which means hypercriticality. We have evidence of a radioiodine surge probably about a month and a half ago that reported six weeks later on uh, the ENE News and, and the uh, what's called the uh, uh, Japan Diary, you know, the Fukushima Diary. Larry, yep. the, the fact the fact is that what's going on here, and we yesterday I want you to recap what you said yesterday about the design of these Mark I reactors. That the top of the reactor there's a major design flaw that allows it to literally burst like a bubble, and the containment can be completely lost. So tell us about that too. Well, I think we just we just went through a little bit about that, and uh, the uh, there is a. Something that's a refueling seal that has to be put into place, and when you when you refuel, remember, uh, Fukushima Unit Four was in the mode, the refueling mode. It was the state of refueling, which makes it different than uh, one, two, and three. So uh, when it when you uh, need to refuel, you got to pull the containment, the dry well dome. Then you've got to pull the reactor vessel head off, and then what you do is you flood up that that. Um, cavity that's above it with with water up to the up to the level of the adjacent spent fuel pool then you have to pull the it's like a dam it's a 35 foot long uh stainless steel uh rectangular plate about six feet wide and you pull it out as a gate and you pull it out and now you have a pathway so that you can move fuel from the spent fuel pool or, or from the reactor into the spent fuel pool and it's all done submerged uh but that that seal that's holding up all that water right now. I looked at it, and I, I would say right now, if I was a, if I was going to bet on it, I would say that seal is being stressed to its limits because of the seismic activity, the building a state of collapse. It's not really, um, it's not, it's not a strong structural member. It is, it's good for what it was designed for, but we're way beyond what it's designed for. Exactly, and, an example uh, of where this is going, by the way. As I report here, reported yesterday from Australia, the, the Bodikin is an area of Australia's northern food bowl now is successful in growing Fukushima rice in Queensland, Australia. What do you think of that? And I read that. So, I, well, I, yeah. I read that. And it means Anne has a comment. Unbelievable. On that. Amazing. Back in a moment with more with Ann Morrison and Chris Harris. <laughs> Welcome back. Let's have some comments about this uh, latest. Uh, Allison McFarland took over the job. The complaints against uh, Jasko is that he was, a, quote, being abusive to some of the women on the panel, which is not true now. He was basically asking for safety standards, but now it's going to be hard to do that because the appointee uh, was against the uh, Mountain, Yucca Mountain facility. That's why Harry Reid got her appointed and uh, Obama uh, recommended her as the replacement. I don't think she's going to be necessarily in the back pocket of industry, and uh, <clears throat> they won't be able to use the excuse that, quote, he was abusive to female members of the five-member uh, board. So what it is is industry wants to race ahead with more dangerous nuclear plants. They want to reactivate, for example, San Onofre, and Jasco said no. Uh, San Onofre, by the way, should not be reactivated at all. Uh, most of the nuclear reactors in America need to have upgraded technology, better safety procedures, and all the radioisotopes that are no longer going to be used in the plant or recycled should be removed and put in permanent facility storage through rail cars, not on freeways and in trucks, but in rail cars taken to a permanent storage facility or more than one facility, ideally something like Yucca Mountain or a tin mine. 
and they need to be away from aquifers, like there's a giant aquifer. It could be affected by the uh, area around the Yucca Mountain, but it's unlikely. If you dig deep enough, you go five to six, seven miles, and you put the facility down there. You want it also open so you can actually check it and, and monitor it to make sure it doesn't right. become critical or have any other problems. I think all these are doable. The problem I see is lack of cooperation. And when they remove JASCO, I think this is an example of just how corrupt the industry is and also how stupid they are. If they blow this completely like they're doing it in Japan, the Japanese people will not allow nuclear power to ever exist in Japan. Uh, people need to understand what's going on is we're killing the oceans, we're killing part of what's called a carbon-oxygen cycle. And that means the world oxygen level is dropping. It means the ozone layer is going to be de- less so that you can protect all your crops and every, all your plants outside. It means you can't screw this cycle up. Yes, we have unlimited oil, basically, from the ground. And we, yes, we're going to need petrochemicals that we don't burn. And yes, you can put more carbon dioxide in the body will con- the, of the planet will convert it to oxygen. So there's a certain amount of stretch. But you can't kill the oceans with toxic pollution and depleted uranium. You can't be cut chopping down all the forests and all the other oxygen-producing plants and they expect that it's a never-ending supply of oxygen and not hit what's called the, the, that boundary zone of what I call peak oxygen. So nuclear has to be part of our future, but it has to be safe nuclear. And the way it's done now, near fault lines, near tsunami zones, on the coastline, all of this is stupid, and it needs to have enough money put into it that's safe we also need to have better power distribution, like plasma distribution lines that don't have power distribution centers where you can lose anywhere from 20 to 70 percent of your power along the power lines. And uh, <clears throat> we need to get into other types of alternative energy, but that that's not going to replace our need for petrochemicals. And uh, nuclear, if it's done properly, is safe. Pebble bed reactors, thorium reactors, and I have fusion reactors that need helium three with tokamak fusion spiral. Tokamak fusion torsion field engines. These are torsion field engines that create a curved time space to compress those particles that approach the speed of light in the center of the reactor, and they fuse helium-3 and create the, uh, the blast of plasma energy that's drawn off of that plasma field and creates the uh, tokamak reactor engine. And they, they have had these for years. I mean, when people say, oh, you can't do that, I said, that's not true at all. Uh, that's the real danger is that they think, oh, we want to get rid of all nuclear power. Get rid of old, stupid nuclear power like the, you talked about the bad design at San Onofre. And we talked about this before. 1,500 tubes gone wrong. There was a problem with the welding of the tubes and their special plate there uh, behind. Can you explain that, uh, Chris? Because this is important. People understand San Onofre does not and should not open with these reactors. They should also switch any nuclear reactor on a fault line to a gas turbine based on liquid natural gas. Uh, and just be done with it. The idea, if you're near a fault line, forget it. Don't put a reactor there. Right. Well, well, in San Onofre, in that case, we found that a design change in the steam generators <clears throat> where a, a different kind of support system for the tubes, the thousands of tubes. In their yeah, it's not like for like, in other words. You told me, you explained it to me. Li- yeah. Not like for like. They actually switched the design of the tube, which wasn't safe, and it was venting off tritium and other isotopes, and that's why the tubes burned out quickly and even quicker when they had a station blackout. What happens was, because since they weren't supported in, in an adequate fashion, uh, what happened is the flow of the uh, secondary side, which is the feed water side, and this, it, where, where it starts turning into steam, this, the flow actually caused the tubes to start singing. You know, they, they start vibrating. They start vibrating, yeah. And uh, the accelerated uh, uh, external uh, uh, wear on the tubes, which is which something we do check for, and uh, we can pick it up, and they, they are they, they found it, that that's what's, what exactly happened. Yeah, as if as you actually day, x-rayed them or did ultrasound, you'd see actually metallurgical wear because you get vibrating tubes will cause micro-fractures in the actual paracrystalline structure of the metal in the tubes. That's right. And uh, where they started rubbing against a, a support plate that was there uh, was way in excess of what was designed for and so that the two started to uh, wear. How do you fix that? I, I really don't know right now other than... Uh, don't fix it. Tear it down. you got to start from scratch. It was a bad design. Uh, well, that bad, is a very bad design. Bad design. Bad design. design. Start all over. What they did was something illegal engineering-wise, which is they said like for like, and then they had all kinds of thousands of more tubes, and they changed the design and never checked to see if these things ever vented off tritium. Uh, well, each steam generator puts out uh, uh, six or between six and seven million pounds of mass per hour of steam. I mean, so that's that's a lot of steam. Remember, it's about thirteen, it's about thirteen total. 
So that definitely is very similar to uh, one I used to work at. And uh, so when you have that much flow, you've got to be able to support the tubes adequately, or else when they vibrate, they're going to they go quick, and they all go together too, because that's uh, yeah, that, that's the other thing too. Well, you don't just they also cause harmonic you, vibrations. You've got a bunch of well, what happens is they also vibrate harmonically because of the same physical structure, so they're going to start getting harmonic vibrations throughout the whole machine. Yes, the whole thing gets affected like that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so, exactly. Uh, yeah, it's so, a big heat exchanger. I mean, uh, you know, you, any one of your audience is familiar with heat exchangers. It's a big uh, one with big U-tubes, big bent tubes, and uh, yeah. they're in a vertical orientation so uh, that the tube sheet is down at the bottom and the okay, tube let's, is at the top. Let's talk about timelines and preparedness. First thing we tell people, get our radiation, a first line of defense kit, radiation kit. Get yourself prepared. Uh, we now have PrepareWise food on our site. We tell people to get themselves storage containers, let's say two to five gallon containers. Get a BEV 200 system and water and a 12 volt pump. Get yourself ready for anything. We got uh, cyclones on and hurricanes coming. There's one coming toward the Florida coast, one coming toward the Mexican coast. We're moving into what I call storm season in both the Pacific and Atlantic. People need to realize that extreme weather puts our power systems in danger. It also puts in danger these nuclear plants. And the areas where you can grow crops are changing dramatically. When we're talking about moving, uh, growing crops from Japan to Queensland, Australia, they don't want to tell the public, but the fact is they're quietly moving chunks of Japan all the way to India. There's an area in Kerala, India, where they've moved it. Uh, and what would you tell people in terms of preparedness that they need to do right now so they get ready for what can happen? Because I think we're going to have a crash of cooling pool number four probably by the midsummer. I think we're going to have a at least a partial, uh, you know, panicky, evacuation of parts of Tokyo. It should be completely evacuated already, but it's not, because if the air is a disaster, they're not going to get those people out of there, and they're going to get highly radiated. They're not doing anything to stop the black current from being poisoned in the Alaskan and the southern uh, hemispheric uh, fishery off of Peru and Chile. Those are that those radioisotope waters are moving there. Within two and a half years, those radioisotopes from Japan will have literally circulated the planet. So it's not just like, oh, that's a Pacific Ocean problem. That's a problem with California. No, no. Those radiation plumes are going to go all the way out of the world. And, in fact, one of the best ways they go is over the poles. They may not at all even go near North America. They may just go straight over the pole, land in Russia, land in Norway, head down to Central Europe and the Middle East. They can go wherever they want, but the closest way to go over is over the pole. Yes, well, um, with this with this uh, increasing UV um, index, I think that people need to be aware that they need to protect themselves from the from the sunlight and their children too and their families. And so I'm saying, dig fast and dig deep. If you don't have a basement to go to or some kind of underground uh, room in which to uh, work and live, you need to be thinking about that. If your house doesn't have a basement, you might want to try to sell your house and get into a house that does have a basement. Or you can get a but, container and actually put it into even into a side of a hill. Uh, well, you know, for you know, forty-eight thousand dollars, you get a steel container and build yourself a uh, radiation protectant or a zone. The other thing is these. Ultraviolet light things are going to dry out crops, dry out plants, and increase the chances of very bad wildfires. And because of the drying out of the West, we're going to see big wildfires this summer. So be prepared. A lot of the mountain areas are Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, etc. They're going to have real bad times and already having them. Be prepared. Better to be prepared a year early than a day too late. <laughs> and and for those people on uh, traveling during the Memorial Day weekend, travel safely. Don't drink and drive. Do enjoy yourself. Don't go out in the midday sun unless you're wearing protective clothing and hats because you're going to get burnt, not just with sunlight. It'll give you a sunburn. It can cause immune suppression, cancer, and many other conditions because we have toxic sun out there now. And this is not a joke. The earth is changing, and it's going to change for the worst before things get better. Amazing program today. Thank you, Ann Morrison our regular contributor, and Chris Harris, our nuclear expert. Have a wonderful week, and we'll be back Monday with our special. And look out for our newsletter. 